to the evil. He says, this is not Barana. There is no imagination possible for this. And it seems that this, he means to say that, well, this, these evil people should be punished. This is my view. <laughs> and so the, the Philip says, no. Okay, <laughs> let's argue about this. <laughs> yes, but I think that, that, that in general, I think Vyasa is a kind of a politically a conformist kind of a, he doesn't want. So that, that goes along with this Bhashya, 345. Shaktopi, Navi, Pariyav, Samkaroti, don't be a revolutionary, yes. But what you say, that, but what I take from, from your comment is that imagination is a very dangerous kind of procedure because it creates reality, imagination. So you should be, with, you should be very careful with your imagination and just don't go too far and don't be evil, etc., etc. It's a, it's a very big thing to do, uh, very big to think about it, about the nature of imagination, how dangerous it is because it's bhavana. It's something which causes to be. Uh, I just have a quick comment. I think if I heard you correctly, this bhavana is, I think, more closer to the mimamsaka type bhavana, this, uh, uh, like a yagena so, swargam bhavayet. It's a bhavitur bhavananukula bhavitur vyapara vishesha. Do, you do something that allows that event to occur. But that's just, I just leave it there, but I just wanted to drop a note that from the tantric side, uh, because substantial amount of bhavayet keeps coming. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I just published one article in Seras uh, on imagination. I'll email it to you, uh, if you may. So, it just a month ago, uh, something like a month ago, it came out. And I have addressed this bhava, how constituting reality is, is what is there, because it's a, it's a bhavanam, most of what you just discussed. Came out a month ago. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, yes, I, I think that uh, you've uh, really hit upon a central uh, problem with the interpretation of the text. That here, here we have 337 in this denigrating of cities, but as you say, over half the book is concerned with cities. More than that. More than half the book <laughs> is concerned with cities. It's not just there are cities for every individual yama, every individual niyama, and so on. And also, uh, even in the fourth, uh, the fourth even in the Amana Samadhi, huh? Samadhi itself can be seen, is, is in one place, I believe, seen as mm. a city. Mm. Uh, so now, um, uh, so, so all is fine. Uh, I, let me just add, uh, before I get to my main point, that uh, Bhavana, how about the translation uh, enlivening? Um, or re-enlivening. I notice that often in, uh, in tantric texts they talk about uh, in, in re-enlivening an intention and in, in a sun cult or something like that. But to get to my main point, that is, um, to me, t too much stress on the imagination, and you seem to be worried about this a little bit, uh, makes it um, seem as though these cities cannot really be and, and that does seem to fit with some of the cities, like uh, flying, uh, uh, levitation, uh, and, and, and some others. But take, for example, the city for Ahimsa. That is, the city of Ahimsa is supposed to be that in, your, in the yogi or yogini's presence, uh, all creatures' uh, enmity disappears. Mm -hmm. uh, this one, and also, I don't know, the city for uh, a parikraha, with you know jewels approach one and so on. This doesn't seem like something that would be the second one in particular. Doesn't seem like something that you would imagine. But I heard Swami Satyananda Saraswati explain this very well. Is that if you really um, lose your possessiveness, then you live in the wealth of the world. Uh, so he had a way of giving a really factual interpretation of that city. And, you know, St. Francis of Assisi... Uh, Parira, sort of by the way, is another, is another city. My, 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 my point is that it seems to me that some cities are intended to be realized in a real way, whereas other ones are not. And so um, how, how do you deal with that distinction of cities? Yeah, uh, it's interesting. Anyway, you stay with the power of imagination, in a sense. But look at, for example, Mahatma Gandhi's kind of, uh, he's a great uh, 
exponent of the power of Ahimsa. He says, against Ahimsa, no weapon can stand. Ahimsa is a, and, and also, you know, he carried the, the sutra in his pocket. When in, in, in the 40s especially, when he went and spoke to people in India under this uh, the dire stress of, 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 uh, of violence of all kinds, he, he, he carried this, and I think uh, Mahatma Gandhi's uh, kind of uh, career is actually based upon the truth that you said, the, the, the empirical truth of uh, 235, yes? And uh, you're right. So we have to make this kind of distinction, although if you take it, it I, I, and I see it, it's very interesting your comment, because I, I see you, you point to the difference between levitation and non-violence as cities. It's interesting. That's how you have to develop a theory of the city. Yeah, I like to add, uh, just um, you know, as a moderator, I can take it for a second, well, Gandhi's example, that he not only carried the uh, Yuga Sutra, he extensively talks about how he um, used, does the focus on Satya, and he says, I want to say something, and without even saying that things should occur. That's what he wants to do. And also Ahimsa and Aprigraha. And all, so it's very interesting to see that he's not talking about just simple imagination. He's thinking about materializing it, not only for himself, but for the public service and the service of masses. So it's very interesting to see that. So, yeah, thank you. Yes. Thank you. I enjoyed your uh, creative presentation about the sense the creativity of the, the yogi. And, the, and I thought that perhaps your, your move can be taken one step ahead. You, you, you spoke of Bhavana as the power to bring into being. Mm -hmm. So if the cities are about this power, about gaining the power to bring into being, perhaps the next step would be to realize that if I can bring things into being, if I can create a world for myself, I can also uncreate or I can stop to create. So maybe, maybe implied from your presentation is that the cities are, are about, are about uh, illustrating the possibility of non-creation. What do you mean by non-creation? Stopping the word, niroda, no, non-worldliness. Uh, yeah, okay, in general, well, what I think that you start, uh, start a kind of a talk about the discipline of imagination, what it means. And uh, I think um, it, it's, it's a big question. Uh, I've mentioned before the uh, large number of sutras which diagnose the human condition, for example. What is, what, this is kind of imagination of something which you, you should let go of. You should let go of, of the, um, the, the conventional present human condition. I, I, I and create a space this for... This world or our reality is in, is in fact made of imagination. And if this is the case, then perhaps we can stop this. Yeah. Let's do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There go round. Yeah. Okay. I'm still enjoying it. So. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, Edwin Bryant has arrived. Yay! Not by, not by city, by aeroplane. <laughs> I'd just like to note that whether they're real or not, they're taken very seriously. Right from the Rig Veda, we have a reference to a, a, a black garbed ascetic flying uh, through the sky. They pervade the Puranas of Buddhism, they per uh, pervade Buddhist narrative, Jain narrative, even the rational Nyaya, uh, Nyaya Sutra makes a reference to the cities. And nowhere does it say that these are imaginary. So I would like to suggest that <clears throat> Another thing is that, that uh, many malevolent uh, characters, asuras, were doing something that looked very much like yoga, intense types of tapas. Just think of the story of Ravana, Hiranyakasipu, Vrikshasana. Um, so the, the, uh, so uh, there were uh, characters uh, in, in the forest, uh, in the landscape of ancient India, doing something that looked like yoga, but whose intentions could very well have been malevolent. And this actually carries on into the 18th, 19th century, even especially in the folklore, where the yogis, if you read Singleton's book, 
are considered to be scary, dangerous, powerful characters. So I'd like to suggest, perhaps, that the reason Patanjali mentions them is because of this. He wants to make a distinction between, between the types of practices that might have been going on at the time that had nothing to do with yoga, but looked very much like yoga insofar as they involved intense forms of concentration and tapas, uh, but were actually, might have been malevolent, asuric in intention, and make a distinction between those types of practices and, and what he's going to say, the real yogis uh, who, who do not, you know, and who, who don't, uh, are not interested in these things. I understand that you say something about a kind of a, a political, a polemical kind of aspect to the Yoga Sutra. Yes, that's what you say, actually. It's a kind of a polemical use of this mentioning of this, but it is, uh, it should have been it, much, very much present in his mind in order to to include such a large amount of cities in the Yoga Sutra. It's endless, actually. I mean, the number of cities uh, against the kind of not malevolent uh, is actually endless. Yes. Well, thank you so much, because we have to move on, and I know we have a um, few hands, and we'll get to those questions afterwards. So please give a big hand. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, 